Hello and welcome to the Endless Possibilities podcast. My name is Eva and today I'm here with my co-host and good friend Garrett. Hi Garrett. Hello, how are you? Good I'm to very be good. here. How are you? Yeah, great that we are back doing another episode and today we have a very special guest. Hello Elizabeth. Hello. Hello. Nice to be here. Yeah, Hi Elizabeth. So, so great that you're here. Um, yeah, today is going to be a very special episode. We're going to learn about you, your spiritual journey and about your work. And I'm just going to read out a little bit about what you do so that our listeners know what to expect. Okay, so your full name is Elizabeth Losi and you're a PhD. Um, Elizabeth has been working with Akashic Records since 2010 and with crystals of all varieties over 15 years. She's helping people and businesses to overcome the obstacles and limitations. She helps opening yourself to your sacred depths and the limitless nature of your essence self and helps to unlock the richness, nourishment, spaciousness and self-validation you've been looking for. Elizabeth is an oracle, a magician, a crystal wisdom keeper, a mystic guide, a mystic midwife, a priestess, Atlant Atlantean accelerator, a fierce advocate for the feminine, a reality waiver, um, a sacred space holder, voice for the divine, dragon rider, I think that's very interesting, stargazer, portal opener, love warrior, poet, and unrepentant essentialist. So yeah, very interesting description. <laughs> I've, I've got so many questions that have just <laughs> yeah. sprung up straight away. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. so excited. great to have you on. Thank you. It's my pleasure and honor to be here with you. Mm. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. Perfect. Garrett, do you want to start? Uh, I, I mean, a dragon. I, can, can you tell me what a dragon rider is? Well, I work with dragons quite a bit. And... Um, a dragon rider, um, those who recognize themselves as dragon riders will straight away, even if they didn't know until two seconds ago that such a thing existed, they'll recognize themselves as such because it'll be like, <gasps> it'll strike their bodies with a resonant frequency. Um, if, if you work with dragons, and of course you cannot ride a dragon without um the dragon's permission <laughs> correct so, so these are um, non-physical uh, uh these are non-physical they... dragons at the moment um but we we work so much uh in the portals and the ethereal they're you know be between the between the worlds i should say yeah yeah so yeah wow Great. and how do you perceive them You know, to me, to me, they're quite as real as anything I see in the Akashic records. Um, and it and it has to do with uh, I feel like it's born from my relationship with crystals. Crystals are also these really powerful beings that um, have, spoken to their companions their human companions um throughout the ages but there are more and more human companions available these days more and more humans who really understand what crystals are and understand that we are all crystals in fact um but um you know i, I think of dragons as as being a part of the fey world and uh as unicorns as fairies and i do um not so much these days but five six years ago i worked a lot i guess it was seven years ago now um i was working a lot with the the fey world and um mythic creatures i call myself a mythic midwife and um the i do believe that crystals have opened the mythic portals in this world and so i think 
we've all seen that dragons and unicorns have over the last 15 years really 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 burst onto the scene where you know it's not at all unusual to see um you know in, in large stores Dang. or the masses mainstream stores uh, aisles full of dragon stuff and unicorn stuff <laughs> and um so uh their presence is growing and will continue to do so i think um that's what i'm hearing from them that they uh 1500 to 2000 years ago the dragons in particular uh who are very much the fey world is is a very um what i would describe as a divine feminine ruled world where grace and love and compassion and the heart rule and uh which is not to say that the divine masculine isn't a great thing but we are currently living in the end of this patriarchal age and uh so near the beginning of the patriarchal age the dragons were just like you know what uh, we're just going to step back into our own dimension <laughs> and uh but they're back and so I, I think that um, maybe not in my lifetime, but soon we will um, be seeing more dragons in material form on planet Earth. So, so I guess the Game of Thrones would really kind of mm. bring a spotlight on dragons kind of in this time. I also I'm friends with a woman on Facebook and I, I met her a couple of times in person, but she's always posting photographs of clouds and the clouds somehow resemble the shape of dragons, you know, whenever. And she she is she's in communication with dragons and she's she posted. So, I, yeah, I it is something that that I'm starting to notice people talking about dragons. A little bit. Yeah, I mean, um and it's it's one of these things when when you awaken to your connection with dragons just as when i awoke to my connection with crystals it was powerful and immediate and i couldn't i couldn't get enough mm. and uh dragons and unicorns uh, my parents were both uh medievalists they had a phd in a medieval french drama <laughs> each of them so our house growing up was full of unicorns and dragons and tapestries and stories and all the things so um it, to me they they weren't unusual and uh so i i think even as a child the dragons were talking to me um and when then i went through a period um where i sort of dropped out of my native knowingness and into a sort of like, oh, I need, in order to get parental approval, uh, I, I need to focus. And uh, I did spend, you know, as a child, I, I was intelligent enough to keep part of my brain on the classroom, but I also watched the sky all the time. I, I would watch the clouds in the sky and the wind moving the treetops at the edge of the schoolyard that was where my focus was all the time and uh when i was about four or five suddenly i was struck because i had lived abroad as a two and three year old we had moved to france for a year and so i recognized that um when i was in france my united states life felt like a dream and then once I was back in the U.S., my life in France felt like a dream. And I was looking, I remember it was springtime, I was holding on to a flowering forsythia branch, and I was looking up into the sky, and suddenly it struck me like, oh, this the earth plane is the dream, and out there is the reality. And I also knew that I probably couldn't tell my parents that, you know, that they, my mother in particular, would not have responded well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking back to it now, I I believe my dad would have been okay, but I didn't really have access to him. Uh, 
yeah, he, he was sort of held behind a rampart um, by my mother. And uh, so mm -hmm. anyway, um, yeah. So I, at age eight, I, I suddenly was like, oh, all right, stop thinking about dragons. Stop think looking at the clouds. Let's um, let's get to business here and do the. Just I just have a short question. So mm -hmm. because you were saying you were looking at the trees and the clouds, so is this how dragons or also fairies and all of that they showed themselves to you in these forms? Is that how you saw them, or or what is the why why were you looking at at the, the clouds? I, and I the don't trees? know. I, I don't okay. know about my fascination with the sky. It just seemed mm -hmm. like the sky was where reality existed okay the, okay mm -hmm. the reality that i wanted to participate in you know mm -hmm. and no. it just seems like that was the place to look yeah okay perfect <laughs> i mean flying would be a cool thing right mm -hmm. if we could fly uh, on a dra on a dragon <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's even better exactly. I'm a big, well, I'm a big, uh, game of thrones um has yeah. given people a a sense of what it might be to live in a world inhabited by dragons and possibly mm -hmm. to ride dragons i um i thought it was a beautifully done story until the very last episode um, but also just the incredible violence of it was disturbing uh, for me. As, as I was about to teach my um, Mythic Allies Dragons course, um, I, I watched several seasons. So I had seen, I had seen my husband watching it sometimes and um, I was turned on by the look of it and really turned off by the violence. Um, but so I, I sat myself down to, to watch many seasons sort of in a row and I had horrible dreams for weeks. I, I really mm. didn't enjoy the experience. Yeah. Although, I mean, you know, to be culturally literate, I had to do it, especially since it was you know, the thing that everyone was mm, thinking of when, when I spoke of dragons. So, yeah, mm. yeah I bet. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess we better talk a little bit about what got you into your work, mm. a little bit about just your background. You've kind of started us off there. Um, yeah. So I, um, my, my doctorate is also in French literature, but 20th century French literature. And I, I had a whole career in which I, you know, was an internationally known scholar and an award-winning professor and um, even chair of my department at age 35. And uh, suddenly in, when my daughter was born, uh, that was, when my intuition kicked into super high gear. But even before that, I, I'll, I'll briefly say the sort of the conversion moment when I went back to um, a, a more native Piscean nature was um, I was, um, I, I always think that everyone should have a therapist because it's important to you know talk things through with people. And uh, so I was sitting in my therapist's office, her name was Sherry. And at the end of the at the end of our conversation, she changed seats. She got up and walked across her office and changed seats to really indicate, like, okay, we're done with our therapeutic session and this is something else. And she said, Elizabeth, I have something to tell you. It's a really big shift in my life. And I really need to tell you about it. And I'm not sure how you're going to respond. So I'm just gonna say it. And that is that I've started channeling an entity named Michael and he wants to say hi. And so because, because wow. I had spent so much time sort of um, focusing on like, oh, only documentable evidence and all these things, I, I did my doctorate in Madison, Wisconsin, which is an incredibly spiritual place. And I was surrounded by it. And uh, I, you know, I, I went out to sort of sit under the full moon in front of the lake. It turned out I, I lived right next to an, a hill. Uh, which turned out to be an Indian mound. Um, 
and I'm part Cherokee. And, uh, and and there were drum groups that would play across the lake, an enormous lake. There were four four lakes actually, and uh, and I I spread out my blanket and I had some wine with me and and I found myself. I was shocked. I was watching myself do it and thinking like, what is going on? And instead of pouring the wine into a cup to drink it from, I started pouring it in the four directions. I was pouring out libation under this full moon um, th around, around, around my blanket. And I, I didn't say anything out loud, but I could tell that, you know, there was something going on inside. And I was thinking like, what is this? And later I, I understood that I was pouring out libations and just, you know, setting sacred space for myself. And there was a transition happening there. Um, so I had chosen to, to live for seven years in this highly uh, spiritual place, super high vibration, um, practically on an Indian mound um, and uh, surrounded by people i mean i had never heard of chakras or flower essences or i mean this was in the early 90s right but suddenly here it is um and uh i didn't i did learn about those things sort of tangentially and uh as i was working on my phd i my for fun reading was learning about things like palmistry and um, auras and, um, you know, essential oils and things and, uh, and massage. And I just, but the, it was like two different worlds that one was like the play world and the other was um, the serious world. And then as uh, my friend and therapist was saying, um, I've started channeling an entity named Michael and he wants to say hi. My first response was to roll my eyes and snort because, <laughs> you know, as someone who was dedicated to like the truth and evidence and all of that, I I had believed that channeling was something made up to manipulate woolly minded people. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to, cause I, I loved, I loved my person. I mean, I, I had been working with her for a year and a half, uh, you know, every month and she was amazing. And um, so I thought, okay, I am going to roll my eyes and snort, but on the other side of the door, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to be polite <laughs> about it. And so I stood up from this, uh, yellow flowery chintz couch where I had been seated for the last hour to um to leave and but this hello from Michael was already underway and wow it was like an atomic bomb of love went off in that space and I was blown off my feet back into that chintz couch with my like my elbows or my, my shoulders sort of nailed to the back of the couch and my eyes like saucers. And so I went in the, in the, that amount of time from thinking this is made up to man manipulate people who just aren't good at thinking to bleep. I don't know if we need to like bleep out um, um, expletives here, but it, I was definitely nope. thinking in expletives <laughs> like, holy shit, this is for real. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like that. And, um, and so that was, that was in uh, 2001. And, uh, and then six months later, so I was okay with her doing it because I could tell that it wasn't really her, but within six months, I was also channeling an entity, uh, who was like a, um, like an intergalactic walrus. And uh, his name was Georgie, and I could tell he wanted to come in because I could I could feel my my face sort of re reorganize itself. You know, somebody asked, like, were you really growing tusks? And I'm like, mm, gosh, you don't have much imagination, do you? But so, but but I could I could feel my nose shortening. I have a rather long nose. I could feel my nose shortening and my my cheeks kind of moving 
apart to like make room for his energetic tusks and uh he was a healer and so he would scan people's by he had a list because of the tusks and uh so when he <laughs> inhabited me i had a lisp too and so he would he would use my body and he was very sweet and um and he he would he he would uh scan down people's bodies and um and tell them like uh, oh can i ask a a really yeah. quick question why was he a walrus was that how he know. appeared to you i don't i or don't know had he a life as a walrus or he did i mean uh you know, he he was like when he was using my body, he was my size, but he he had tusks like a walrus. I I don't know why. Um, that's a good question. I never asked him, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, wherever he was from, I guess like they could choose. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what to look like and and how uh, lost uh, well, yeah. no go ahead eva no you go first you probably I, we, well i was going to say well like the fact that we're talking about native american um ancestry and so like uh, they use an awful lot of animals they come through right that the, mm -hmm. the their totem poles and stuff right? like that they have big connection to animals and healings yeah well they they live in um harmony with the planet and yeah all the creatures of the planet yeah um the yeah. totem Even poles are are much more um pacific northwest and um aleutian islands uh so my ancestors didn't um produce that but um uh I mean, I think it's no accident that I was holding on to a flowering branch when I had that big aha as a kid. Like, oh, this here in the earth plane is the dream and out there is the reality. Um, and then, of course, you know, later on, I realized that I'd spent lifetimes as a priestess. And that's where I learned to pour out libations to the four cardinal directions, you know. So I was... Uh, I was remembering things without remembering, right? I just like, it just was knew. an automatic thing. If you're under the full moon, standing on an Indian mound with wine, listening to drums come across the water, you that's what you do. You're like, <laughs> okay, you honor the moment. And so, yeah, I guess I'm so, highly- So back to the walrus. Yeah. <laughs> back to the walrus, Georgie. Back to the walrus. <laughs> And my question was, uh, so when he came in for you to channel the first time, like how did it show himself? And also how did you feel because it was the first time or did you already know this is happening because your friend did it, your therapist, you kind of were familiar with it, but it's like, you know, how, do, how did the first time um, occur? She, she, um, she was doing these sessions and people would drive in from a hundred miles away to attend these uh sort of ask me anything kinds of sessions with Michael and I had never been to one before uh, but I did go that week it was a Wednesday evening and um and you know as she was setting sacred space and asking us all to sort of like really be in our bodies and relax our different muscle groups and we ended by relaxing our jaws and um suddenly uh my mouth opened and there were like a hundred different voices saying hello in different accents hello hello <laughs> i mean it was just like okay and um and so <laughs> and so michael was already sort of there and he's like well that's very interesting and um uh why don't why don't you why don't you make an appointment with Sherry for later this week, which I did do, and then the next week uh, on Wednesday at the next Michael session, um, you know, and this was in in front of a bunch of people, like maybe twenty people, uh, most of whom I I didn't know. Turned out one of them was 
the mother of my star French major student. <laughs> and, um, and then the next week, uh, it was just Georgie. It was just one voice and, and he said hi. And so Michael was a little like, um, he's like, you, you need to, he was talking to Georgie. He's like, you need to learn when it's appropriate to come in and not. And so then I, I went in to see Sherry again to sort of like learn how to like close the taps mm -hmm. on Georgie's presence because it was very powerful. It was hard to say no. Um, but uh, yeah, so from then on sort of um, Georgie, Georgie would come and, and uh, Michael would, would nod to me when it was appropriate for him to to join in and um anyway so i i channeled georgie um for the time that uh sherry was channeling michael she stopped after a while because it was taking a toll on her physical system um and then sometimes sherry sometimes other people who knew michael from the early days would ask me like if Georgie could come and check a certain health thing for them. And, uh, and then um, in my second, I was telling you before we started the call about my first, my first experience of channeling my own Akashic records. And I went to Atlantis in the hall of records with all the, everyone's records held in crystals. The second time I, also went to Atlantis, but was a I was taken straight past the Hall of Records to um, a, like the harbor, and uh, you know, sort of hustled onto a, a kind of a a raft that was um, uh, it was actually a lot like a chariot, except for it was like a water chariot that was being drawn by dolphins to this very rocky island, and when I um, when I got there, I, I went inside and there was Georgie and, um, and so he's he, Atlantean. Well, so he's, he wasn't really, I mean, we were out of Atlantis, but he, okay. but he said, he handed me this, um, this, this sort of small wooden, um, box, like a little chest and, and I opened it up and it had a golden key and he said, this isn't a key that really opens anything, but it's sort of like uh, a diploma would be for you. Mm -hmm. And um, and he said, I am just a couple galaxies away. I'm not that far. Like, if you need me, I will come. But you don't. And, um, and then uh, and then he's like, OK, off you go. And um, and so that that was my second trip into the Akashic Records. My third trip into the Akashic Records, I, I was taken up to the clouds and I was met by Saint-Germain, Saint-Germain, mm -hmm. and a very tall angel. And at the time, I wasn't really on board with angels. I didn't really know anything about angels. I'm like sort of eye rolly about angels honestly I feel bad about that but uh, this very tall angel who never said anything but just really was shining this beautiful pink light from his heart to me and um and Saint-Germain said like okay I'm, I'm here to be like we're sort of your guides in the records and um and this is Samuel and I was like okay I'm gonna look that up when I when I'm done it's like Samuel but with a sh sound at the at the beginning and uh, then I was taken up into this amazing like elevator going through dimensions of space and I arrived and it was there was like a witness chair in front of a, a high bar like some court of so kind of like supreme court and then these beings of light came out they didn't really have faces they had some light bodies but I you know and there was like the one who was uh, I would associate with being like the chief justice came down because I was scared I was really like oh no have I violated some universal law here 
<laughs> like I must be in trouble. And uh, so the chief justice came down. She had a very grandmotherly energy. She put her arm around around me on the top of the chair and she said, sweetheart, do you think you could get here if we didn't invite you? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, this is to impress you with the fact that you have access to all of this now. Mm -hmm. And Quick it's question. not in violation of any. Yeah. Can I just ask how you were getting into these states? Was it true meditation? Was it trance? Was it just daydreaming? How did it open up? I had... Was it so my mentor in the Akashic Records, her name is Jen Aramuth. She doesn't really work with private clients much anymore. She and her partner have kids now, and they've really been amazing parents and just totally sort of focused on them, which is wonderful. Um, but uh, she she channeled for me a uh, an opening prayer or meditation and a closing one as well. And when I teach others to channel Akashic records and you know we're always getting into their records to say okay is this is this right for you and is Elizabeth the right teacher which is how I did it with Jen um, that was the main part of the application was getting into my records and asking those questions um, so I had this meditation and uh, as as we were working on it she said okay your homework is to open your records every day and, um, you know, let me know, because it's different for everyone. Let me know what what is consistent for you and like how you know this. And um, the um, immediately following my initial session in my own records with her, by the way, um, my very first question in my records was, who am I on a soul level? And the answer was beautiful. It made me cry, but I didn't understand it at all. And it was, uh, you are a truth teller with capital T's. And when you sing your truth song, imprisoned angels are set free. And I thought that is beautiful. Hmm. And how, how does it apply? I'm chair of my department. I you know, <laughs> I publish articles. I, I I give talks around the world. That's cool. <laughs> um, I I didn't think that was like the truth telling part, um, but I didn't I didn't know how that worked. But um, I got into my records again with Jen within a couple of weeks because it just felt like oh, and in fact it was Sherry the the one who had been channeling Michael who said okay, I've just had my records channeled you need to do this. This is for you. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> but she said, no, we, we're not ordering lunch. Cause at that point, like, as soon as I started channeling Georgie, she's like, all right, we're just colleagues now. Um, we'll just go out to lunch every Friday, which we did. And, uh, that was, it was wonderful. And, uh, a very interesting schooling in my intuition. And so, um, once I, uh, sort of unlocked the connection to Akashic Records, then I had this huge desire to um, work with Tarot, which actually took me immediately to Crystals. I've sort of left the Tarot aside. But the very first time I opened my own records, and for a year and a half after that, every time I would open the records, I would find myself on a hill. And whatever season it was currently was the season where I was. I would find myself on a hill uh, looking at a walled city on another far hill and I was dressed like the fool from the Rider Waite tarot deck the Rider Waite Smith tarot deck and um, I do happen to have a, a white dog but um, I, I couldn't see a white dog there um, and so I was just like okay here we are let's see, let's see what happens you know and so I was walking on on this it was kind of a wide road but it wasn't paved. And I, I went down the hill and there, what I hadn't seen at first was this sort of woods at the bottom of the hill. And I thought, oh, okay. You know, according to medieval literature, when you go through a woods, that's where magic happens. I was like, oh, this is interesting. And um, so, and I, 
and I at the bottom of the hill in the woods there was this sort of footpath that crossed the main road which was going to the city on the other hill and I'm like oh I was called to turn off to the left and um when I you know went through the woods for a while and I arrived at a clearing and there my um my essence self her name is Alice and uh because I'm French and English bilingual like she she's a, a lady from the 12th century English court who also spoke French, Alice. And um, so she greeted me. And as soon as she did, all of a sudden, like there were a hundred people with like tools, medieval tools in their hands, medieval garb. And they like in a twinkling, they had built this half timber gatehouse. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. So I went over there. And uh, as soon as I touched the wrought iron handle of this door I had there was a jerk behind my belly button and so I went inside and and I wasn't in this narrow interior but I was in a, a vaster space like an atrium that's when I was in Atlantis the first time and so the same thing happened the second time it was a slightly different gatehouse and I was in Atlantis because I expected to go there but um, then I was taken on that sort of water chariot to visit uh with georgie and then the third time um uh i didn't i didn't even wait for the gatehouse there was this this like okay now we go up to the clouds and meet saint germain and shamuel and uh once i came down from that very high place with the high court and you know was talking to them a little bit and they were explaining some things to me uh when i when I got out of my records, then um, I picked up my laptop and I, because I was just taking notes the whole time. Um, I, I looked it up. I Googled. I was like, hmm, Angel Shamuel. Let's put a CH in front of it. And of course, Shamuel is the Lord of the Pink Ray. And like, he hadn't said a word to me, but was like just beaming this pink light. And I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the evidence that I needed that I was channeling. I was a clear channel. And then by the time I, you know, got back to like my next week's appointment with Jen, my mentor, uh, and I told her about it, she's like, yeah. And so um, later on when I would channel for her as part of my training, she's like, yep, you're a very, very clear channel. And unlike me, you don't merely channel information um, you have the ability to transmit healing energy. So, mm -hmm. wow, wow. So, so I have a question. What is all stored in the Akashic records? What oh. can you access? Um, what's stored in the Akashic records is, um, so the Akashic records is a, is a compendium. It's kind of like a library, and uh or an archive and when i explain to people uh what the akashic records are i say you know how people say my life flashed before my eyes when they have a near-death experience for example that is the human brain sort of connecting in extremis with their akashic records but there is so much information in there that they it can't all be grokked in a single moment but it it's this sped up kind of film and um but that's just like for me that's the first row of bookcases in their library and uh mostly the people I work with and you too of course um have had many 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 lives like no one who's a, a new soul um is interested in Akashic records because they're they're still discovering stuff right and they're still you know having an interesting time at their earth vacation right and i i like to think of it that way some people say earth school which you know is not false but it, for me being on planet earth is like uh an extreme sports vacation like we come here to have boot camp well maybe <laughs> or like i don't know like skiing down double diamond slopes or something like there's a lot of excitement Eva, Eva does that 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am not much of a skier, so I I don't ever do any any kind of diamond, but um um yeah, just the to to have the racing heart and the like the experience of love and loss and all the things I I feel like um plus uh it suggests that it's just for a short amount of time and then we we go back to wherever our home is right and stay there and uh, decide the kinds of experiences and with whom we want to incarnate the next time and uh and come again they're just like oh after we get home from vacation we're really happy to be back in our home place but then after a short amount of time we start planning our next vacation like oh okay i'd really like to have this you know it's like i, I did um i was surfing last time maybe this time i do skiing or uh, i just i kind of want like a, a chill vacation at the beach or or whatever and so you you dial in uh your thing so um I don't want to get too far away from your question, Eva. Um, the the Akashic records, every individual has an Akashic record, and um, every place has an Akashic record. Every event has an Akashic record. Um, for animals, especially if um, they are human companions, um, a lot of them have individual records. For uh for things like uh insects, generally, uh some, I mean there there are many, you know, millions of them. You can um access the the records of ants or of fruit flies or whatever, but not any. It's a collective, individual. though. Is it a collective? It's a, yeah, it's a collective record, record yeah. right? And, I mean, okay. the, the there is a human collective record as well. Right, mm -hmm. but there, there are some more precision um, events have an akashic record that you can tap into. Um, your podcast has an akashic record, um, and uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because this wow. this sprung to my mind. Eva Eva said about the reading, and I was like, hmm, I wonder could we access the akashic records of what may possibly come about with this podcast. So maybe maybe we can look at that later. That was yeah, something yeah. that came to my my mind. You just you just uh, mm -hmm. recited it cool. there, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay, so so you're now in your journey. You're starting to access these akashic records for clients. Clients start to come to you. So what? Who? How do they find out about you? And like, what sort of people come? And what do they want to know? What What can you access for them? Mm, that's a great question. So I started. Um, I quit my academic career. Um, my my first time in the Akashic Records, where I was this, you know, truth teller, setting imprisoned angels free. That was May eighteenth. 2008. My last day as a professor was May 15th, 2010. So it took less than two years. And, uh, and so I, I did my first training the next month. And uh, so that was the next month. By that autumn, I did another um, month of mentorship just to refine and um and then i started taking private clients so i've been working with people for 13 and a half years um and i have spent a lot of time helping people understand their relationships and figuring out what is the best next step uh lots of people have um you know, they exist in a lot of turmoil if they're unclear about their romantic partnerships. And so they want to know, like, OK, is it best for me to stay with this person to, you know, take the next step? We're talking about, a you know, a relationship escalator. Like, OK, you know, like, is it better for us to uh, move in together or, you know, exchange some kind of vow or um, because it's been difficult, like 
can you tell me more about why it's difficult and if it's meant to be difficult and what the best way is to like make it through the difficulty and or like is it better to just say like I love you I always will and yet living together is not doing it for me um but also you know with um understanding your children or your boss or bosses or colleagues or underlings I have done quite a bit of work helping um business owners um to uh really you know meet the challenges and particular entrepreneurs uh you know um Mark Zuckerberg famously says, uh, go fast and break things. Um, but with Akashic Records help, you can go fast without breaking things. And every time you come to a crossroads, you can, you know, which way to go. Like if you, you know, so people work with me for that. Um, and, and also crossroads in relationships, but also other things. I, um, some people are really interested in their past lives. I worked with a woman many years ago whose entire uh, session with me was just about her various past lives. She was older. She was in her 70s. And she she wanted to know about her various past lives. And that was one of the most fun sessions I ever did because it was, um, you know, her, her joy was at meeting like all the truths about herself and and then um and she kept exclaiming saying like oh I totally know uh, that because and then would go into something and it was that was just quite something and um but I also I help people uh work with their legendary self which is um part of the essence self but the 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 part of of our essence self that holds the thread of purpose and um that legendary self work um is m much less me channeling records for someone although the, their records are open and more um me walking them through an experience mm -hmm. uh almost like a, a shamanic journey to to meet their um, legendary self and and to really I prompt them with this all recorded so you know they can go back to it and I encourage everyone to do that because there's so much stuff and so I'm, I'm always saying like okay so what do you see in this moment I'm seeing it too but I I, I mean I I think it's better that the wisdom come from them right mm. it's more empowering anyway and uh so so they are having this thing and and uh you know I I'm I, I might ask like, okay, so what is, what is your legendary self wearing or having his or her or its hand? It's not always a, a human, of course, um, <clears throat> or human oid. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's really powerful. And um, ultimately when uh, people do legendary self work, or they follow it up with a really intensive being mythic, like three months of just really like emotional transmutation and owning their gifts. Um, then like the point of that is to make me obsolete in their lives. Like you are so connected to who you are and what you're about in this lifetime. You don't, you don't need my help. I don't, I mean, you know, it's not great for my bottom line, I guess, but, uh, I mean, that's, that's, I'm not really interested in money. I, I'm more interested in the upliftment of the world and bringing more love into people's lives. And and there's always going to be a new stream of people coming, right? Yeah. So, so once you help these people be independent and, and, and have access to that, they, you know, they move on and then new people come in and it's like mm -hmm. a conveyor belt. Right. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Sometimes yeah. less the, the, honestly, the um, pandemic, um, broke my conveyor belt <laughs> because uh, there. I mean, it was interesting because it was a time when it would have been the perfect time to really, you know, learn about oneself if one didn't, you know, have the opportunity yeah. to, to be away at work. Not everyone, you know, there were lots of essential workers, of course, and I don't want to pretend that there weren't. 
Um, but uh, it would have been a perfect time, but so many of my regular clients, uh, because you know, they would come to me when they were in this expansion mode and wanting to like, you know, open new wings of their business or like trying new product lines or launching something or whatever it might be. They were, everyone just sort of like just got back. smaller rather mm -hmm. than bigger. And so like my conveyor belt sort of broke, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's coming back. So. Mm -hmm. And I have a question. So for example, you mentioned somebody would like to launch a product or I don't know, open a new wing in the company. So you go into the Akashic record and you channel the possibility uh, or the, the potential what's there for this business wing, for example, or for this product. And you see there is none for it or there is some for it. And if yes, what actions need to be taken? Is that something that yes, you do? And or how does I work? only, to be clear, uh, I can only see what the client asks for. Mm -hmm. So um, some every Akashic Record channel does it differently. Some people do it on their own. Maybe they have a list of questions or maybe they're just like they have a topic um, that somebody opts in for and they 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 do it on their own and they might, you know, record it or, um, you know, send a document later. That's not how I do it. I do it live. Um and uh recorded and i can only see what my client asks for that's them giving me permission to see that thing and um so uh for example um uh if it's a future thing and they're trying to determine like oh is is this a, a good thing to pursue or not um uh you know asking if it's if it's a good thing but by the way the akashic record keepers they're sort of a mix of fierce warriors kind of like the swiss guards maybe um although i don't see them as that and cosmic librarians like in a research library who who go and like bring you the answer <laughs> <laughs> and so they 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 bring the answer and they give it to me usually in a visual form and then I will translate it and so my experience as as a literary analyst as someone who has a minor in art history as well so I'm I'm using all of those skills it's funny there are no lost steps right I'm I'm using all of those following the threads and like seeing which which part of like it's not you were primed for this. I, you're, yes. you're you're yeah. you're primed for it, right? Yeah. I did. I I mean I at first I was like, why did I spend 20 whole years doing graduate school and then and then you know being a professor? Um, but that I mean, I realized very early on that actually no, that's perfect because the, yeah, you're right. I was primed for it. That was my training. And um, so so I describe what I see. Um, if someone is really asking about um, the success of a future thing, um, I usually tell them to ask me uh, on a scale of one to a hundred, uh, what are the chances of, um, for example, success with this new product line in the next, and then to put a timeline on it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and also like, so what is a measure of success? Like you tell you, you put that in your thing and then uh, I will get a number between one and a hundred back. And if it's a high number, like anything above 70, um, then that's a very strong probability. If it's below 30, it's not a strong probability, but I, then I always say, you know, ask the follow-up question, like, okay, what could I do to increase that probability? And maybe there's nothing. That rarely happens, but, um, you know, may maybe it's nothing. Um, and then and then they could ask something else. And I, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Do the keepers of the Akashic Records ever say to you, no, we can't give this information? Maybe maybe the client comes and the question is very egoic based. And 
because I know from my experience with the larger consciousness system, I would always I could always get stuff, but it was only for my highest good. It was never really for my egoic wanting, like just to know things just for the sake of knowing. So do they ever kind of give you, a, you know, can't give you that information? Well, for one thing. Um, the people who come to to me, at least, for work yeah. in their Akashic Records are highly spiritually evolved people. Um, and so in general, aren't like, you know, sort of driven uniquely by money. I love helping people who are helping people, right? And so that that's why I like to work with entrepreneurs, that they're doing something new, they're bringing something new into the world. Um, and I, it's not everyone that I work with sometimes, uh, cause I do have vetting calls and, uh, sometimes I can tell immediately, even if I just see a name on an email mm -hmm. and then I'm like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna <laughs> say, you know what? I just, I'm, I think we're maybe probably not a good match or we get on the call. I'm like, mm, okay, not a good match. But most people who find me, find me for a reason and, um, it's just like crystals, I think, like so many um, stones that uh, I resonate with, and I resonate with almost all of them. But sometimes I feel like, oh, I have worked with you before. Like you might be holding uh, the record of an experience that we shared maybe 2000 years ago. Right. And so I, I, I feel that in my in my stones, you know, when they come to me, I don't um, I, I mean, I do I do have a, a room full of stones right here, but um, I it's not like I'm incredibly inquisitive and like I just want stones like Cookie Monster. But um, eh, there are certain ones that are like, OK, yes, <laughs> you and I have a contract together and so let's let's see come home with me but um uh your question gareth was about like is there something that maybe they say no about yeah. sometimes yeah. sometimes it's a it's a thing that it wouldn't serve them to know about uh for example child sexual abuse or something that just wouldn't serve them also um i can uh access other people's records but only it's like i if i'm in the records of my client uh let's say it's a woman and you know she's asking me about uh her child which often comes up most people most women who have children want to know about their kids at some point, if they have a little extra time in their session. Um, and if that child is, has already started differentiating, then sometimes there's, it starts off in this, it's the same, like little kids or preborn, um, you know, future children, uh, their records are sort of in the same space as their parents' records. And as they start to differentiate, then it's more like a like an archway in between the two records, and then it gets smaller. It becomes a door, and then there's an actual door that goes on the door frame. And then when they become teenagers, usually there's like a lock on that door. <laughs> like, I oh can't. wow! <laughs> like no, <laughs> I need my own space, mom. Yeah. Um, but uh, there. You know, if if it's a love relationship, for example, and sometimes I do do, you know, I channel for couples who are both on the call. Um, but uh, if someone has a question about someone else, I can um, see as through a window into the other person's records, um, but only insofar as that person is willing to be seen in that way. Like their essence self is in control or like calls in their Akashic record keepers to say, yeah, you know what, we're not. And so there are lots of times I can't see someone else's stuff, but I can get a sort of a whiff of a flavor about it. Like, oh, this is um, 
they just at the moment they need their privacy on this because it's something that they are working out for themselves and uh, you know maybe in a couple months come back and ask again and i might be able to get an answer at that point and has there ever been anyone that you just cannot get access to it's like totally off limits no <laughs> really wow okay Okay, because I, I, I used mean, to do not, not if they're my client. If sure, if my sure. client is asking about someone else, that can sometimes happen. Okay, that's what I mean. That's oh, what okay. I mean. Yeah, yeah there's certain people that mm -hmm. are just off limits. Because mm -hmm. I, I used to go, I used to have out of body experiences, and there were certain things I was allowed to do. I could go places, and then there were certain places I go. Oh, take me there, and I just get this mm, like a null, like no, you're not going there. It's just mm -hmm. off limits. So I was just interested to know. Yeah. And, um, you know, the way I work with people is they um, they send me a list of, of preliminary questions. And when we're both on the line together, I'll, I'll open their list of questions. Because the instant I get eyeballs on their questions, I get a whole bunch of information about how to shift the questions. And, um, you know, to, to target them properly and to make most efficient use of our time in the records. Um, and so, uh, sometimes, um, there are questions there that, and it's usually the, those questions are usually kind of a mess because they, they don't really know what they want, but there's a lot of sort of turbulent energy around it and um so at that point um sometimes i'll i'll throw that out uh and say let's you know hold that situation in your mind and we'll ask the keepers what the best question is to ask <laughs> about that because like at this point i i can't I can't make heads nor, nor tails of, of what you're trying to ask here. Clearly it means a lot to you. Um, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. another one of my um, really memorable and normally I don't recall what I channel for people because it's not for me. It's not my information. It's not mine. So it kind of like floats off like a dream once I come out of a person's records. And then the next day we have an integration call. And when, when my client asks a certain question about a, a piece of it, then I'm then then that allows me to have access to it again, and I can talk about. I one time um, I I met uh, one of my clients in person, um, and um, you know, we had met at an event, and then we met again six months after I had channeled for her at a different event, and she sat down next to me at a table and she started talking, and uh i was just like okay like please let me have access to that again because it seemed important and um and uh, she said she had talked to her siblings about like what i had channeled for her and i finally it was a very long 30 seconds i finally remembered that um part of what we talked about was how her father had um held her and her siblings at gunpoint mm. at a certain time and so she she had stood between her little siblings and her father's gun but i you know it took me a long time to get so i was like oh, i need, need access but um that normally doesn't happen this other one that also was quite memorable so that one you'd think it would be memorable but i couldn't have access to it there was one um, where uh, this woman was out of Australia and um, she actually, she was like, you know what, let's just cancel today because her questions were all like just a turbulent mess. And I was like, okay, let's just go in and find out from the keepers, like what the best thing is to know regarding this situation. And so the, the, really the whole session was about like, okay, you need a reliable yardstick because you are doing so much for so many people. You are exhausted. You can't get the work that you need to get done done like for your soul path. 
And um, so the keepers uh, gave her this yardstick, which I share all the time. I asked if I could, and she said, yes, I, I share all the time because it's so useful. It's like, does this request, she was somebody who, like myself, was a people pleaser, right? She wanted to say yes. And anytime somebody, especially someone she loved, earnestly asked if, if she could help because she was very capable, um, she would always say yes. And so uh, the keepers gave her this tool that says, like, measure every request with, does this make me feel boxed in or not boxed in? And the next day when we did her integration, um, you know, she had had an, an entire day because, you know, we were on different ends of the earth and to like, to get a lot of this stuff done. And uh, she's like, okay, so, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to my one business partner and uh, he's taking over the whole thing. Cause I don't, that's not where my pleasure is. And because it was making me feel boxed in. And I also, in my photography business, I, I hired somebody to help me do the photo editing. Cause that's the part I, I love to take the pictures, but I don't like to edit the photos. And I talked to my husband about like doing these things at home. And he said, yes. And, and so she's like, this is brilliant. I also like all these people who asked me to do things for their events. I, I said, you know what, maybe next time, but I really can't. And so she had in the space of less than 24 hours, just totally like reorganized her entire life. And she's like, Elizabeth, this is like the most amazing feeling ever. And I was like, yeah. And she had wanted to just like throw it all away. Like, no, I'm just gonna cancel our session because this just feels like too much. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, really, really amazing story. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, should we should we go into to our channeling? That would be really Demonstrate. amazing. It's a demonstration. The demonstration yeah. Wow. Okay. If sure. you're up for it, yeah, it would be really yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm gonna. Then we gonna... then we then we get a, a, an idea, you know, a better idea and 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 how it works and everything. Yeah, it would be yeah. so good. Of course. Okay. Brilliant. So um, I'm gonna turn my camera off and mm -hmm. sort of turn away so that I'm not dealing with your energy. Because as I okay. as I mentioned, it's like I I it's harder for me to channel when I because I'm not a psychic. I I don't read people's auras. Um, then that information though does come to me, and so I feel like I have to like it's a jungle through which I need to move <laughs> in order to get far away to like what I'm uh, accessing. Well, I'm would you like us to turn our cameras off? Uh, no that's okay i mean thank you for okay offering, okay but um okay. yeah i'm just gonna turn my camera off or ask you to turn my camera off i'm sure i can do that um okay and then uh i'll just turn around you tell me if you can't hear me very well okay no we can we can hear everything yeah all right um so uh give me just a second i'll i'll open the records for the endless possibilities podcast all right, and I'll Straight. I'll open the records silently, um, and uh, we'll do maybe three questions. And I'll remind you and your listeners to drink plenty of water while we do this. Okay, your records are open. The records of the podcast are open. What would you like to ask? You ask the question, Gerd. Okay, well, on the scale of one to a hundred, what are the what's the outcome of of, of uh, the the podcast and its success? And and how do you how do you measure success? Um, the more people we can reach and the more of a positive message we can spread amongst our viewers and listeners. Well, at, at that point, you already are a success because um, you are reaching people and uh, you're um, uplifting them, um, shifting their frequencies and vibrations. Um, 
And do you have a particular number of people you'd like well, to be reaching? The, yeah, well, the, the podcast, it's, it's in its infancy. So, I mean, we would obviously like to grow it and reach a, a larger audience. Mm -hmm. Which you are, is that, you are yeah. doing that. So it, um, if, even if nothing changes, the the that is that is on the way do you do you want me to um just tell you what the keepers have to say about your podcast yes yes yeah. we'd love to yeah yes please um okay so <laughs> so the akashic record keepers are like yeah you are um the first say are just i don't know if you can hear this in my voice but they're just beaming light to you and uh and just saying, you are absolutely on the right track. And it doesn't matter how quickly it occurs. It doesn't matter how quickly you reach a certain viewership or um, it doesn't matter how, how quickly, um, you know, you have an international following. What matters is that you are doing it and that it brings you joy. And the more it joy it brings you, the more joy and upliftment it will bring to your listeners and your followers. And um, it is absolutely a worthwhile thing to be doing. Um, if you want to know how to increase your viewership is that a question that you're having sure, right now sure mm -hmm. yeah yes um well so there are a number of things you can do one of those things is to um to enlist all of your guides you have legions of support each one of you individually and then the the guides of your your guests, including Elizabeth. And um, so when you engage your guides and then uh, also your ancestors, um, everyone through your ancestral line, um, and the guides of your guests, and also um, the guides of your viewers, um or followers um that and just say you know thank you for sending the message that this is um an interesting place to look and so there it can uh spread it, it doesn't really serve you to be um to have a viral thing um, right away. Mm. It's it's better for endless possibilities to be more like a um, building itself, at least for the first year, to be building itself slowly. In part because if if you um, if your podcast had this experience of going viral too soon it would collapse like a souffle. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Because the foundation and it has been very or... strong enough. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it, it has been quite organic, very kind of slow and steady mm -hmm. over the last seven, seven or eight months has it been? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's perfect. Since we've been that's doing perfect. it. Mm -hmm. But we really enjoy it. Mm, it brings it. us a lot of joy. Yeah. And yeah, and we get to meet great well. guests like you. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, Have and, you any and questions that, about it? That is the most important thing, the joy that it brings you. And the, the more of that joy and that spirit of inquiry and curiosity and um, gratitude and, and all of those emotions that you bring to it, um, those are, amongst humans, those are infectious. And so uh, when you ask people to share, they will. And um, that's that's the organic growth. Mm -hmm. And um, 
there there will be a point at which um uh you'll you'll reach a kind of critical mass when it it starts building faster it's already building faster mm. yeah and um so just uh stay in in your place of heart-centered joy around it and uh, keep building the foundation the the foundation is um critical to uh the structure without a solid foundation a structure can't with withstand certain pressures so you're absolutely on the right path was there another question did eva have a question yeah i have a question so what else can we do to serve our listeners more to help them on their path of spiritual awakening, awakening consciousness, healing their human system? Is there something we can do more of? Yeah. Mm. Are you, are you already offering, um, uh, individual sessions? with your clients? I mean, yeah, I mean we both work with people. Yes, we both mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. um, not right away, but eventually. Um, perhaps in six or seven months, uh, you might start thinking about doing a larger event pulling in uh, collectively um, your speakers from before, your guests, and um, it doesn't need to look like um, a telesummit uh, because that's sort of a tired model at this point. Uh, spiritual people are exhausted by it. Um, but um, it has to do with reweaving the connections between you and, and your guests, but also amongst the guests. There are likely to be some connections amongst your guests. And as you invite your guests to... Um, to meet your other guests and, and absolutely offer them a means, a platform for doing that, um, that will uh, reinvigorate the energy um, for the guests and the, and the guests invitations from, from their guides to, to go forward and to, to carry the message about your podcast out into the world. Right now, um, you are serving the guests, and Elizabeth includes herself in this, uh, you're serving the guests by sort of interviewing them and, and getting the word out about what they do, um, which is lovely, um, but um, the next level is connecting the guests with each other. Mm -hmm. And you could do this by um offering introductions if you if you think oh you know uh for example elizabeth would really vibrate with so and so or so and so would really um love to get to know elizabeth use your intuitions um and offer those introductions already at some point you might do a sort of a virtual event or possibly even um you know a, a live event in Europe where your certain guests could participate as well as um, your public. Mm. That's the thing that is, um, but connecting the guests to each other is um, a novel approach. No one else is doing that. Um, and 
it is going to really uh, there like right now you have a loose network but it will really tighten and fire up in a certain way there there's like a fire web it's a fire web um, but a, mm -hmm. a, a good fire a warming fire uh, a, a life-giving fire um, not not like a, a burn it down kind of fire but really like a crackling and invigorating fire um, when you connect the guests to each other and could that be having maybe two guests back on simultaneously as 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 like an interview that's not quite it um like it it would be good uh you you could do it but not as part of the podcast like that um yeah we see now what you're what you're getting at um you, yes uh, have them interview each other <laughs> <laughs> like okay. maybe you, you stand back and have them interview each other there's some there's something um maybe after they have had a chance to get to know each other a little better um but there is like you are a uh, key mm, to you and your guests are are both um key elements in the rapid increase of viewership for this podcast um in the it's the goodness and the the benefit of the podcast will um increase exponentially uh when you get the guests talking to each other mm -hmm. and um okay. it's it's more off camera at first um but the connections you will be creating um amongst the the different um people that you invite um is going to bring you a lot and them a lot and um it's it's going to crackle uh in a good way like um okay really I, yeah i know one of our past guests wants to interview eva and i as a kind of a a side thing mm -hmm. on on their podcast on on their podcast on their on channel their... yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i understand i understand what what you're talking mm -hmm. about yeah yeah me too me to too. have to get them all together yeah that that's brilliant it will it will just pop up when the right time is and the idea will pop up right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, so it'll be like a party yeah um for people who <laughs> are connected through you but not necessarily any other way and perhaps they have you know seen other episodes and are vaguely familiar with these people but um when you consciously say you know I think um, guest A and guest H would be amazing together. Let's introduce them. Mm -hmm. and, okay. um, and 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 see and see what comes of that connection. There can only be good coming from that connection. Yeah. And the and the first level of good is um, really. Uh, reinvigorating um these guests um interest in your podcast which will uh cause it to bump up in a significant way mm. and um as you make more and more of these connections um the the network gets stronger and stronger and uh there are lots of good things that can come things that you 
can't quite imagine and they're they're not really um showing me what all the good things are but um it uh the 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 dividends are vast i mean we we have something like it already popped up a few months ago right so not exactly what you shared but something like it um yeah so it's interesting that this is coming up again yeah because it's familiar right we've we've been kind of talking about something like it mm -hmm. mm. yeah yeah great great just good to 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 get you know more picture of it because it was very vast when we talked about it so mm -hmm. yeah yeah, perfect. Wonderful. Um, thank you. So like, thank you very much. Records? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, All thank right. you. Yeah. And, and uh, I'll just have, this is Elizabeth again, I'll just have you say, I call my spirit back. And anyone who is listening also call their spirit back by saying, I call my spirit back as many times as you need to. Um, so I call my spirit back. I call my spirit back. The record my keepers like... are shining their love at you again. It's like, oh. And their gratitude for doing this important work in the world. Thank you, keepers. Mm -hmm. So, love Thank for you. life and all it holds. We step back into the world with love and joy. Amen. Your records are closed. Thank you. That was, so that was so cool. Yeah, that was so good. Yeah. So interesting and so helpful. And also so good to know how you work, right? So it's all, all in one. So great. The keepers were pointing me to the crystals that I pulled for today, mm -hmm. including the, the really large citrine, um, which is about abundance and manifestation, but also um, citrine um just transmutes negativity to love and joy and um that one paired with the uh the amazonite which is about speaking your personal truth um really to me talks about like the energy of the podcast like you you were making um you're sort of building the road to the new world with the podcast and the smoky quartz smoky quartz i kept when i was um considering the smoky quartz um it the the quality of smoky quartz that kept sort of jumping out at me was um this smoky quartz has a, a kind of quality of invisibility cloak until the right time and so I, I couldn't really see what that was but now now I can tell that it's like okay this podcast has a has a bit of an invisibility cloak not entirely I mean you're not obviously you're not cloaked but <clears throat> the the masses don't have access to it yet no. um, for a reason so that you can really build that solid foundation um and and be and be ready for all the requests for advertisements for example and it would behoove you to sort of come to terms with do you want to have advertisers or <laughs> what kinds and how many and uh you know are is this a monetizing podcast or are you going to you know um is your is your time going to be rewarded your time and your sacred energy and life force going to be rewarded in other ways and so um all of these things are uh important to decide mm -hmm. so. it's something that's never really come up right we we do it just because it's it's joyful and i mean of course. we get we get to hear so many people who give us great feedback and uh, we open the door for them to find other great people and they're like oh my god I, you know you introduced me to this person and i have a session and 
yeah people's lives are changing from it yes mm. absolutely yeah so you're, you're building a, a wide broad road so that more and more people can come mm. behind and be freed so Wonderful. it's such very, a pleasure to beautiful. have been here thank you so much yeah thank, thank you, you so much for being our guest really it was yes. so interesting fascinating fascinating because, um it's just we, we haven't talked to anybody yet about you know akashic records or crystals records, yeah. so you were the first so that's why it was also so interesting because i hardly know anything about it um mm -hmm. also yeah it was just very interesting how you shared your your story and also the channeling thank you so much for being uh, here. And I and I loved how you rolled your eyes at the angels, but you were perfectly okay with a walrus. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I I had an experience of the of the walrus, and I hadn't an, ahead of that. I hadn't really had an experience. I I sort of associated angels with like Hummel figurines, you know, and like. Yeah. <laughs> well it's kind it kind of reminded me of me because i work with energy right and mm -hmm. i'm constantly doing energy transmissions and, and then all of a sudden so, you know somebody will mention a, a, a different modality of healing and i'll go oh you know <laughs> it's <laughs> i'm kind of I'm, I'm a very skeptical mind i'm very like so that kind of reminded me of, of how i am when i hear something else yeah yeah, every every inch of sort of um, spiritual ground I've gained was hard fought, right? I'm like, really? Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, me too. So, um, yeah, if if I have conversion stories, it's they they are conversions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Converted from my skeptic self to being a like, yeah. okay, this is real, interesting. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Elizabeth. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, everybody, and for listening. Thank you to the, yeah. to the viewers and the listeners. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.